So then we come to the, to the next pillar, which is the um, accuracy. So we, we kind of hear what is important now, right? Now we want to ask the question, like, how can we help the player to guide them? Like, where to look, where to go, how to anticipate stuff. And pretty much we use these three tools, obstruction and occlusion, distance and space, and 3D audio. I want to talk about that for a little bit. So um, our occlusion system, we, we struggled for a long time because we had a rather simple obstruction occlusion uh, computational system, which was a raycast to do obstruction. But you can get unlucky, right? You can just hit that guy. And if, if there is an enemy behind it, it would be occluded. So we cannot drive too much through that, or you do randomized, or you do certain uh, other things. Our implementation was always very simple, and we ran into problems. And then the occlusion, which means that a sound is completely um, encapsulated in a different area, we also never really had time to implement the full system. So we, it was more an on-off switch that we, that we said than having any dynamic range on that signal. So we had some dynamic range here, but we couldn't drive it too much because it was uh, sometimes random and we didn't have too much there. Um, and that's pretty much what I just said. So um, it was pretty black and white. It was really hard to anticipate danger and to help the player to understand what is behind a wall and I don't have to care, and what is behind a palm tree and I have to care. And then we had this special um, scenario where um, Paul, our sound supervisor, was constantly saying, I swear there was someone around me and I couldn't find them. And then we figured out again through shadow play that the person was just upstairs, running around upstairs. And it was, there was an obstruction obviously, but he was so close and we couldn't touch it too much uh, for other scenarios um, that we were really not happy with that system. And at some point our um, lead engine programmers were um, showing technology that uh, we were using for Overwatch for flight path data. And somehow all in, the, all in the sound department said, that would be so cool if instead of shooting rays, we know about the path that we would take to a sound. So that's kind of what we did. Um, in this top-down example, right, we are the listener, there's the sound, we do a ray cast, and then we, we ask this AI data for how long is the path? And there might be a path diversion of a few percentage. So if this is like a 20 meter ray cast and it's like a few meters longer, then we get a value out of that. If it's six meters longer, we get a path diversion <coughs> of 30% and we can take it to an extreme where you know, we still do the simple ray cast and then we do a path calculation. And if that suddenly is, let's say, um, 40 meters long, then we have a, a fully occluded sound. And um, WISE provides um, an obstruction and occlusion system. It lives on the uh, project settings. And Scott will talk in a second about um, um, the pros and cons of that. What, what I'm getting at is we now have a really fluent value um, in a certain dynamic range where it helps us to anticipate um, threat coming towards you. Yeah, so utilizing this value, um, we started with the, the WISE project settings, and we found that uh, it worked really well, but it was hard to tune across different types of sounds. Um, again, since we sort of had that categorized uh, organizational structure within WISE, uh, there we wanted to be able to tune things on a general level, like footsteps have a certain tuning or weapons have a certain tuning. Um, but this being in the project settings didn't allow us that. We were able to maybe do some of that through uh, a ratio we were tuning in our tools, but it was very unwieldy and hard to manage um, and very bug prone. So instead, we went back to RTPCs, um, which were our friend for this project, and we used probably way too many. Um, so the occlusion is the same thing. It from goes from zero, like zero occlusion here, to full occlusion. And we could drive all those same parameters. Uh, we could drive low pass filter, high pass filter, and volume, just like you can in the uh, project settings version of occlusion. But then we could also drive other things, like we were driving aux sends, you know, the more or less sends to reverbs, or more or less sends to our quad delay. Um, that's all sort of driven by that same thing. And again, now it's nice and easy to say, okay, footsteps have this type of curve, but, um, and it's driving all these different parameters here. But uh, 3P Weapon Fire has a very different set of curves. So um, I'll show a couple of these things in the tool. Um, which was that? Uh, thanks. So
So under 3P weapon fire, you'll see that um, we're driving uh, the high pass and low pass on this as well. So the more occluded it gets, you don't necessarily want it to just you know, muffle it. You also want to lose some low frequencies. Um, so that's these two curves. You're then driving um, the aux sense. So in this case, we're actually turning up the aux sense because we like the way that sounded. Um, and in this case, uh, we're, we kind of did this on, on different uh, sounds in different ways. So we use it in, in, in various creative ways to drive different things. It did have one major drawback, though. Um, so especially in regards to the low pass filter. So the other system was an independent low pass that didn't conflict with other low passes in the project, where this one is part of an additive chain of low passes. So what I mean there um, is that certain sounds like uh, carpet footsteps, we would take a concrete footstep and then just go duplicate that down to save on wave data. We would duplicate that and add 20 or 40 low pass to the sound, so you get a muffled version of the same footstep sound. Uh, when we would do that, and then this curve would come along, those, those numbers are very sensitive. It's very, uh, it's the really active values are between 20 and maybe 50, 60, where like your, your listening curve is. And this would come along, and all of a sudden, you'd have a carpet footstep, and you'd go barely behind a wall, and it would disappear entirely, because these numbers would add together, and you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be able to hear the sound in that case. So what we had to do, actually, is we had to go to through all of these carpet footstep sounds and put in real-time EQ effect plugins to to break this uh, uh, relationship between you know this these two different types of low passes that we wanted to drive. All right, so going back. Uh, so overall, I think this is maybe one of the most powerful features we added to the game. Uh, as soon as we put it in, there was this this really amazing feeling of safety. You would go into a cubby hall and everything would just get quiet and muffled and you would hear clearly one person walk in the room or when you would go back out the whole mix would sort of unfold and um, it did it in a smooth transitional way that felt very natural. Um, so you could almost play by listening to the walls a little bit. You would kind of go around and, and, and as you would come to this curve you would hear this, this um, blossoming and it would help you ignore enemies that can't hurt you. So they may be physically close but this guy who's right under the stage, for example, has to walk over there and around and up to come get me. Well, th even though they're physically close, we don't really want to hear the sound that loud because of uh, the path. So we have some examples here. Um, so here's footsteps and weapons. You'll hear uh, Widowmaker here. Uh, just walk around the corner and back. And uh, just notice how the footsteps have very different curve from the weapon. And you'll be able to anticipate when she's going to be visible and not. So you can still hear that weapon, but you can't hear her footsteps at all. So you can basically hear how far away she is from, your, from that location. And you can use that information to anticipate her coming and to react to her. Uh, so next video example is of a full battle. So this will show, when I go back into the cubby hole, how everything kind of dims down and gets uh, a lot quieter and you feel a sense of safety. So you'll even notice if you listen cl uh, closely that it's high noon. That line had a very distinct curve that more or less ignored the walls because those are so key to the gameplay. Hearing him say that, that's his ultimate ability. When, when the McCree, the cowboy, says that, he could basically one shot kill anyone in sight. So as soon as you hear that line, you had to react and hide and, and react accordingly. Um, we purposely avoided some of the, 
um, occlusion values on things like ultimate abili ability lines and sounds, so you could react to them regardless. Yep. Yeah, I think there is some stuff you want to talk about, about oh, sure. just in general. Yeah, so um, in general, sounds in the game, we, di we took an a, a approach that is, is becoming obviously very common, especially with the proliferation of Wise. Um, we layered our sounds based on distance, so you'd hear like the distance layers when you're far away, and then the, the close layers would come in, and the mech layer would come when you're right on top of it. We do indoor-outdoor tail switching. Uh, we're doing filtering of low-pass and high-pass filters over distance. Uh, we're even utilizing this feature called Focus and Spread, which we co-developed with WISE, uh, which um, actually they, they developed and we just asked for it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, the, the spread was essentially a way to try and make things very stereo, um, but still pan around the field. We ended up uh, asking for this feature, but didn't end up using it as much as we thought because the, the pinpoint accuracy of sounds uh, was kind of took... Uh, precedence over what we would have aesthetically liked. And that's kind of a, um, a thing that I want to bring across is like, you know, through most of the other games in my career, it was always aesthetics above all. Uh, and you wanted it to have a cinematic huge feel. But in this game, it was very much like, okay, it, it may not sound cinematic to have this wide stereo spread, but it's better for the game to say this person's right there. And so we narrowed things in despite our, um, our, our instincts, I suppose. And then finally, the last thing I want to talk about in this slide is the uh, reverb and quad delay. Uh, we use that to place things in the world, and we have some good examples of that. Uh, so this is a, a screenshot top down of our character Zarya. And she's shooting a beam out in front of her, so you have some reference point. And what we do is we actually uh, ray trace out to each of the walls that are surrounding her and get an idea of how far away these walls are and what type of space, you know, distance-wise, uh, she is in. So then we use these values, and we made a custom plugin uh, with the help of a, a contractor. Uh, and we took um, four delay lines into a plugin and allowed it to pan to each of the surround speakers, front left, front right, rear left, rear right. And when we drove all these parameters via RTPC um, based on how close a wall was to you. So this kind of gave uh, an automatic uh, early, early reflection type of um, simulation, not exactly 100% real world, but close enough that it felt like you were in the space and we could run many sounds through this plugin through the aux bus structure. So um, I'll show you some examples of the RTPCs that we set up on this because it drives a ton of different data um, through to get the sound. So if I go look up here and I find our aux buses under 2D audio, and I expand and find our quad delay. We have two different versions. We have one for loud sounds that would uh, echo in the environment or quiet sounds like footsteps that wouldn't echo as far. Um, and then the effect is driven by all of those parameters. So if I go over to the RTPC on this, and I normally sort these by some notes we put in here so we can see, so like there's like the three delay taps and notch frequencies. Now if I select all these, that's all the parameters that are being driven based on just those four distances. So some of these are delay times, some of these are volumes, some of these are low pass or high pass of that individual delay line. There's a notch frequency that we're driving. And all of these things basically make it so there's a bright reflection if it's close. If this wall is close here, I'll get bright reflections from the side. If that wall over there is far away, I get a more muted, dull, echo type of reflection from that distance. So uh, there's some video examples of this that I'd love to show you. Uh, where'd it go? Yeah. Okay, so this um, starts with only the effect, so you won't hear any dry signal. So it's going to sound a little strange, and then you bring, we'll see the same thing again with the dry signal brought in, and you'll see how it puts a sense of space into the sounds. The only thing you're hearing there is the stereo version of that quad delay plugin.
So you can hear those distinct, distant uh, slapback delays. And we don't, have to, we don't have to modulate or do any authoring in that. It's kind of set up once. We, we worked with the, uh, the curves and the RTPCs a lot. But um, once it was set up, we don't have to change this from a level to level basis. Um, and then I also want to talk a bit about Dolby Atmos. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work with uh, Dolby and Audio Kinetic to bring this for the, um, to be the first game to use Dolby Atmos for headphones. Um, it was uh, uh, something that came about at GDC of 2015 where we heard a demo of their HRTF technology where they took an Atmos mix of our cinematic and rendered it into a headphone mix. And I, and I heard it, and in the video, the, there was a Widowmaker that grapples up to the ledge and, and shoots down at the, uh, at the um, scene. And you could hear in this headphone mix the clear behind and up to the right. And I was like, okay, I could hear her there. That'd be great to, to, to work with in the game. So we started talking to him around that time, and, and it was a lot of back and forth. We tried different um, means of implementing this into WISE, and I think we came up with something that's really great. Um, and I could show you a bit of how that's uh, actually set in the engine, um, because we talked about the bus structure earlier. Um, so this division between 2D and 3D audio was done right before we shipped for that very reason. Um, Right here uh, is the Dolby headphone virtualizer, and this bus is set to, uh, in real time, when the game uh, flips this mode on, this bus becomes a 12, or sorry, uh, what is it, 7.1.4 uh, bus configuration. That then, that gets fed to the virtualizer, and um, the headphone mix, you know, you can hear things pan around above, around, and behind you. Uh, it's, for me, it's been a huge uh, bonus in playing the game. Once, especially, like it's cool right off the bat, but as you get uh, used to it, you can just pick up all these little details and you're like, oh, he's right above me. You just know that he's there or this guy's behind me. And to get that through headphones that anyone owns, by the way, this is regular stereo headphones. You don't need to buy anything for this to run. Um, it's best if it's an analog jack because that way you don't have any virtualization going on. Um, if you have a 7.1 or 5.1 uh, pair of headphones, you should turn off that virtualization to use this feature. But um, it's been a really uh, great thing for us. It's, it's helped with that goal of uh, trying to um, play by sound a lot. So. Yeah, and that was, that was the whole pillar of uh, pinpoint accuracy, right? So we, these were the three things we talked about, occlusion obstruction, um, what was the middle one? Um, quad delay, quad delay yeah. and then Atmos, right? With, so.